Hello, welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Mike Parker, the class instructor. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. The time and location are available on the class website. Links to the class website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, The Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoy this lesson, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And if you haven't already subscribed, please do so. That way you'll be notified when new content is posted to this channel. In this lesson, we'll be studying King Benjamin's Temple Discourse found in Mosiah chapters two through six. The key individuals in this lesson are Benjamin, the son of Mosiah the first, and king of the combined people of Mosiah and people of Zarahemla, who lived in the land of Zarahemla, and Mosiah the second, the eldest son of Benjamin, and heir to his throne. The outline of events in this lesson is, Mosiah completed the preparations for his father's address at the temple in Zarahemla, King Benjamin's address to his people, which was a sermon composed of seven parts, and the people's covenant response. Mosiah assumed the throne and established righteousness. Approximately 40 years before the events of this lesson, a group of righteous Nephites left the land of Nephi and migrated north to the land of Zarahemla, where they discovered and joined with the people of Zarahemla. The events in this lesson took place entirely at the temple in the land of Zarahemla. As we discussed in the last lesson, the elderly King Benjamin selected his oldest son, Mosiah, as his successor and commanded him to make a proclamation throughout all this land among all this people, that thereby they may be gathered together. He declared that, at this gathering, he would proclaim Mosiah as his heir and give this people a name that thereby they may be distinguished above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of the land of Jerusalem. He gave Mosiah charge concerning all the affairs of the kingdom and conferred upon him the brass plates, the plates of Nephi, the sword of Laban, and the Leahona. The people of Mosiah and the people of Zarahemla were few enough in number that they were all able to gather to the temple in Zarahemla with only one day's notice, yet there were enough of them that they couldn't be numbered. The elements of this event include the gathering of the people to hear the king's farewell address, the coronation of a new king, the sacrifices of animals, and the dwelling of the people in tents as they listened to Benjamin. Terence L. Zink and John W. Welch note that these features, quote, point toward the idea that King Benjamin's speech was delivered in the fall at the time of the year when all ancient Israelites, including peoples of the Book of Mormon, would have been celebrating their great autumn festival season, which included many ancient elements that later became enduring parts of the Jewish holidays of Rosh Hashanah, the new year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths." Unquote. Benjamin may have underestimated how many people would gather to the temple and expected that they would all fit inside the temple grounds where they could hear him. When it became apparent that their numbers were too large for everyone to hear him, he ordered that a tower be built so he could speak from an elevated position. But even that was insufficient, so scribes had to write his words and have them read to people who were still too distant to hear Benjamin speak. King Benjamin's address is masterfully structured. 
in seven parts with four interludes. He may have delivered it over several days. Benjamin's address is organized thematically in the chiastic pattern A, B, C, D, C prime, B prime, A prime. The focal point D is the teachings of an angel about sanctification through the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Part A, all are indebted to God, the heavenly king. Benjamin began by pleading with his people to take his words seriously and to open your ears that ye may hear and your hearts that ye may understand and your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded to your view. Benjamin first defended his personal conduct during his reign. He had not commanded the people to assemble because they feared him or because he claimed to be a god, as most rulers throughout history have. He was king by lineage, but had been chosen by the voice of the people and suffered, or allowed, by the Lord to rule. Benjamin defined rule not as domination, but rather as service. He had not taken riches from the people for his own benefit, nor had he used prisons, nor permitted slavery or moral disorder. In fact, he had supported himself by his own labor instead of living off taxes. All these things he had done so that he could answer a clear conscience before God this day. Benjamin cited his personal service as an example of how the people should serve each other and, in doing so, provide service to God. Mosiah 2, 16 through 19, quote, Behold, I say unto you, that because I said unto you that I had spent my days in your service, I do not desire to boast, for I have only been in the service of God. And behold, I tell you these things, that ye may learn wisdom, that ye may learn that when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. Behold, ye have called me your king, and if I, whom ye call your king, do labor to serve you, then ought not ye to labor to serve one another? And behold also, if I, whom ye call your king, who has spent his days in your service, and yet has been in the service of God, do merit any thanks from you, oh, how you ought to thank your heavenly king. Benjamin declared that true wisdom is knowing how to serve God by serving one another. This is a key element of the covenant into which he will ask his people to enter. One Book of Mormon commentary explained, quote, in the divine relationship, we become the Lord's servants when we enter his service. With the Lord as our master, we also have access to abilities and possibilities that are otherwise unavailable. We willingly yield him our obedience in exchange for greater blessings. God created us and he is keeping us alive moment to moment. It is so beyond our ability to repay God for these blessings that any service we could give him would be considered worthless. We would be unprofitable servants. So if we are unable to reimburse God for all that he has done, what does he require of us? That we keep his commandments, which if we do, he immediately blesses us. God can never owe us one or be in our debt. This was Benjamin's explanation for why he could not boast of all the things that he had accomplished as their king. All people, including kings, cannot say that they are even as much as the dust of the earth. And yet we were created of the dust of the earth and the earth was created by God. Benjamin had therefore called his people together, not because he enjoyed ordering them around as their king, but so that he could fulfill his responsibility to serve God by teaching the people. Interlude 1, the coronation announcement. Benjamin announced that, due to the frailty of old age, he would abdicate the throne. 
He then announced, probably accompanied by formalities, presentation to the people, and acclamation by the assembly, that his son Mosiah was his successor to the throne and their king and ruler. Part B, the consequences of obedience and disobedience. Benjamin appealed to his people to be obedient to God's commandments given to them by his son, Mosiah, just as they had been obedient to Benjamin and his father, Mosiah the first. He framed this commandment by placing it in the context of the covenant that God made with Lehi and his descendants. If ye shall keep the commandments of my son, or the commandments of God, which shall be delivered unto you by him, ye shall prosper in the land. He warned them to avoid contending with one another, and to not list, or desire, choose, to obey the evil spirit, that is to say the devil. For he who does so drinketh damnation, to his own soul. He reminded them that they had been taught and their scriptures recorded that they were to consecrate everything they had to God. Ye are eternally indebted to your heavenly Father to render to him all that you have and are. Because they had been plainly taught God's commandments, if you should transgress and go contrary to that which has been spoken, ye do withdraw yourselves from the Spirit of the Lord. He warned them that the man that doeth this, the same cometh out in open rebellion against God. Rebellion is a subject Benjamin will return to later in his address. A man who dies in the state of rebellion without repenting, dies an enemy to God, is subject to the demands of divine justice and the guilt and pain and anguish he experiences is like an unquenchable fire. Mercy, he warned, hath no claim on that man. Benjamin concluded this portion of his address by contrasting the fate of those who disobey God with those who are obedient to his commandments. Mosiah 2, 40 and 41, quote, O oh, all ye old men, and also ye young men, and you little children who can understand my words, for I have spoken plainly unto you that ye might understand, I pray that ye should awake to a remembrance of the awful situation of those that have fallen into transgression. And moreover, I would desire that ye should consider on the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God, for behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. And if they hold out faithful to the end, they are received into heaven, that thereby they may dwell with God in a state of never-ending happiness. Oh, remember, remember that these things are true, for the Lord God hath spoken it." Unquote. Interlude 2. Benjamin preceded the next part of his address, by calling his people to attention, for I have somewhat more to speak unto you. This language may imply that he and his people had just returned from a break, perhaps for a meal or at the start of the next day. Part C, an angel's testimony of the incarnation and works of Jesus Christ, the Lord God omnipotent. Parts C and D, which include all of chapter three, contain Benjamin's account of a revelation he received from an angel of God who personally visited him. His quotation of the angel's words begins in verse three. The angel may have appeared to Benjamin at night in response to Benjamin's righteous prayers. He twice commanded the king to awake. The angel declared that the time cometh and is not far distant when the Lord Omnipotent who reigneth, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity, will take human form and shall go forth amongst men working mighty miracles. He taught that the incarnate Lord would be fully human. He wouldn't avoid the hardships of mortality just because he was God. In fact, he would suffer even more than man can suffer 
for blood cometh from every poor, so great shall be his anguish for the wickedness and the abominations of his people. The Gospel of Luke records that Jesus' sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. In a revelation to Joseph Smith, the Lord said that his suffering in Gethsemane caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, and to bleed at every pore, and to suffer both body and spirit. The name title Jesus Christ was first revealed in the Book of Mormon to Nephi, who also learned that Christ is the Father of heaven and earth. Nephi saw the mother of Jesus, but her name was not revealed to him. The angel told Benjamin that her name would be Mary. The angel affirmed that salvation comes through faith in Christ, that Christ would be crucified and resurrected, and he would judge the world in righteousness. Part D. Having established the nature and person of Christ, the angel taught about sanctification through Christ. This is the focal point of Benjamin's address. The angel told Benjamin that Christ's blood atoneth for the sins of those who have fallen by the transgression of Adam. All mankind is subject to the fall, as well as to salvation from the effects of the fall through Christ's atonement. His atonement operates in diverse ways on different people, depending on the conditions of their mortal probation and how they respond to the message of the gospel. The angel described five specific circumstances. Group one, his blood atoneth for the sins of those who have died, not knowing the will of God concerning them. The vast majority of people who have lived on this earth have never heard the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are they that knew no law, who shall have part in the first resurrection. For the atonement satisfieth the demands of his justice upon all those who have not the law given to them. Many of these individuals would have received the gospel in this life if they had heard it preached. They will hear and receive the gospel in the spirit world after death, and they will be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. Others of them are good individuals who would not have accepted the gospel even if they had heard it during mortality. They will inherit the terrestrial kingdom. Group two, his blood atoneth for the sins of those who have ignorantly sinned. These individuals received God's law and intended to obey it, but they violated all or part of it unknowingly or unconsciously. The law given to Moses included instructions on offering animal sacrifices for sins committed in ignorance. The atonement of Christ replaced those sacrifices and covers unintentional sins. Group three, the angel pronounced woes upon him who knoweth that he rebelleth against God. These are they who received God's law, but willfully and purposefully acted against it. The angel declared that salvation cometh to none such, except it be through repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Book of Mormon has quite a bit to say about the dangers of rebelling against God. We'll discuss rebellion more in upcoming lessons. Because of mankind's rebellious nature, the Lord has sent prophets to teach that whosoever should believe that Christ should come, the same might receive remission of their sins. The Law of Moses, remember Benjamin was speaking to people who lived that law and who would wonder how Christ's atonement would fit into it, was designed to bring a stiff-necked people to Christ, and yet they hardened their hearts and did not understand that the law of Moses availeth nothing except it were through the atonement of his blood. Group four, little children in Adam, or by nature, they fall, even so, the blood of Christ atoneth for their sins. Because we are born into a fallen world, 
Even little children have fallen natures, but they are blessed and incapable of committing sin, just as with those who did not receive God's law or who ignorantly sinned, the blood of Christ atoneth for their sins. Mormon later taught, little children are whole, for they are not capable of committing sin. Wherefore, the curse of Adam is taken from them in me, that it hath no power over them. Group 5. All men and women, except they humble themselves and become as little children. Mosiah 3, verses 17 through 19. Quote, And moreover, I say unto you, that there shall be no other name given, nor any other way nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. For behold, he judgeth, and his judgment is just, and the infant perisheth not that dieth in his infancy, but men drink damnation to their own souls, except they humble themselves and become as little children, and believe that salvation was, and is, and is to come, in and through the atoning blood of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. For the natural man is an enemy to God, and has been from the fall of Adam, and will be forever and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, and putteth off the natural man, and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord, and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child doth submit to his father." Unquote. The Lord declared to Noah that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Alma taught his wayward son Corianton that all men are in a state of nature, or I would say in a carnal state, are in the gall of bitterness and in the bonds of iniquity, they are without God in the world, and they have gone contrary to the nature of God. Therefore, they are in a state contrary to the nature of happiness. Because all men and women are stubborn and rebellious by nature, salvation can only come to that person who repenteth and cometh unto Christ as a little child and becomes a saint or holy one. Sister Carol F. McConkie of the Young Women General Presidency summarized in April 2017 General Conference, quote, according to the inspired words of King Benjamin, those who become saints through the atonement of Jesus Christ are those who are submissive, meek, humble, patient, and full of love, as the Savior is. He prophesied that Jesus Christ, the Lord Omnipotent, who reigneth, who was, and is from all eternity to all eternity, shall come down from heaven among the children of men and shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay. He came to bless the sick, the lame, the deaf, and the blind, and to raise those who had died to life. And yet he suffered more than man can suffer, except it be unto death. And though he is the only one through whom salvation comes, he was mocked, scourged, and crucified. But the Son of God rose from the grave, that we may all overcome death. He is the one who will stand to judge the world in righteousness. He is the one who will redeem us all. He is the Holy One of Israel. Jesus Christ is the beauty of holiness." Unquote. As time passes, more and more people are going to be called upon to put off the natural man. The knowledge of the Savior shall spread throughout every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and none shall be found blameless before God, except it be little children, meaning both actual children and adults who have spiritually become children through repentance and faith on the name of the Lord God Omnipotent. The angel's teachings of Christ, which were given to him by the Lord himself, shall stand as a bright or clear testimony against this people at the judgment day, when every person will be judged according to his works. The angel then concluded with a stern warning against those whose works are evil, for 
they have drunk damnation to their own souls. This concluded Benjamin's quotation of the message he received from the angel. Interlude 3. The people confessed and received remission of their sins. As Benjamin instructed his people about the fallen nature of man and salvation through Jesus Christ, they bowed down with their faces to the ground, an ancient act that expresses awe, worship, submission, and repentance. With one voice, Benjamin's people cried aloud, O oh, have mercy, and apply the atoning blood of Christ, that we may receive forgiveness of our sins, and our hearts may be purified. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth and all things, who shall come down among the children of men. It's unlikely that their lengthy confession, comprising the second half of verse 2, was spontaneous. Rather, they were probably led by a priest or other representative of the king. After confessing faith in the atonement of Christ, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they were filled with joy, having received a remission of their sins and having peace of conscience. Part C Prime after the people received Christ, Benjamin bore testimony of God's goodness. His teachings from this point forward were intended for those who have been converted. Those who have received a knowledge of God and of the atonement, and who have put their trust in the Lord and continue in the faith, are those who receive salvation through the atonement of Christ. There is no other way to salvation except through Christ and the conditions he has set forth. Having therefore been converted, we must believe in God, repent of and forsake our sins, and remember and always retain in remembrance the greatness of God, remaining humble, praying daily, and standing steadfastly in the faith of Christ. If we do this, we will always rejoice and be filled with the love of God, and always retain a remission of your sins, and you shall grow in the knowledge of the glory of him that created you. Benjamin's teachings in the section emphasize that salvation is not something we receive once. We receive it regularly and continually throughout our lives. Salvation in Christ involves daily prayer and repentance, weekly renewal via the sacrament, and lifelong commitment. Part B Prime Benjamin instructed his people about the required righteous behaviors of those who have been redeemed. In summary, we will not have an intention or inclination to injure one another, but to live peaceably and to render to every man according to that which is his due. Regarding our children, we are commanded to not neglect them temporally or spiritually, but to teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness and to love one another and to serve one another. The remainder of Benjamin's teachings in this section concerned the obligation of charitable giving. He laid out a moral and theological argument for giving to the poor and needy. He began with the commandment, succor, or run to support, those that stand in need of your succor, and administer of your substance unto him that standeth in need. In response to those who are rich and who could argue that they should withhold giving to those who are needy because of their own poor choices, Benjamin declared that those who justify their selfishness in this way hath great cause to repent, for they hath no interest in the kingdom of God. We are all beggars in God's eyes, both for temporal blessings and for spiritual blessings, and he has given us what we need in abundance. Therefore, we should follow God's example. If we judge others harshly in their time of need, God will judge us in like manner. In response to those who are poor and have nothing to give, Benjamin warned them to be certain that their intentions are right with God, that they would give if they had something to give. This is the only way for them to remain guiltless when asked to help the poor. Benjamin summarized, if we wish to retain a remission of our sins and walk guiltless before God, we must impart of our substance, 
both temporally and spiritually, to the poor, the hungry, the naked, and the sick. But, he cautioned, we should use wisdom and order in our giving, and not overdo it, for it is not requisite that a man should run faster than he has strength. Benjamin warned that we must return the things that we borrow, or else perhaps thou shalt cause thy neighbor to commit sin also. This sin may refer to others being forced to engage in lawsuits or employ other illegal or immoral means to collect their unreturned property from us. Benjamin knew that he couldn't give a complete and comprehensive list of all the obligations placed upon a converted individual. There are many ways in which we could sin, even so many that Benjamin cannot number them. But we must always be mindful of our thoughts, words, and deeds, and observe to keep the commandments of God, and continue in the faith, even unto the end of your lives. He gave his final exhortation, and now, O man, remember and perish not. Interlude 4 the covenant response of Benjamin's people. Having concluded his address, Benjamin sent messengers out among his people, desiring to know if they believed the words which he had spoken unto them. Benjamin's people responded with an affirmation of total faith in his teachings. We know of their surety and truth because of the spirit of the Lord Omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us or in our hearts that we have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. They expressed a willingness to enter into a covenant with our God to do his will and to be obedient to his commandments in all things that he shall command us all the remainder of our days. Like the words spoken by the people in Mosiah chapter 4, verse 2, they were probably led in the lengthy spoken covenant agreement by a priest or other representative of the king. Part A, Prime, Benjamin gave his people a new name. When Benjamin had called the people together so he could teach them, he promised that he would give this people a name that thereby they may be distinguished above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of the land of Jerusalem. Now, after they had received God's covenant and been born again, he gave them that name. Mosiah 5, verses 6 through 8. Quote, and now these are the words which King Benjamin desired of them, and therefore he said unto them, Ye have spoken the words that I desired, and the covenant which ye have made is a righteous covenant. And now, because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him, and have become his sons and his daughters. And under this head ye are made free, and there is no other head whereby ye can be made free. And there is no other name given whereby salvation cometh. Therefore I would that ye should take upon you the name of Christ, all you that have entered into the covenant with God, that ye should be obedient unto the end of your lives." Unquote. Sister Lisa L. Harkness of the Primary General Presidency taught, quote, Our willingness to take upon us the name of Christ is more than a formal exchange of words. It is not a passive promise or a cultural contrivance. It is not a rite of passage or a name tag that we wear. It is not a saying that we simply place on a shelf or hang on a wall. His is a name that is put on, written in our hearts, and engraven upon our countenances. The Savior's atoning sacrifice should be remembered always through our thoughts, actions, and interactions with others. Not only does he remember our names, but he remembers us always." Unquote. Benjamin then declared that those who take upon them the name of Christ shall be found at the right hand of God. Those who reject Christ and his covenant, however, must be called by some other name. They will be found 
on the left hand of God. Biblical scholar Craig Keener explained that, in ancient Hebrew texts, to be seated at the right hand of the king was a position of great honor and authority. To be seated at God's right hand was to be enthroned as a ruler of the cosmos. We still use the term right-hand man to refer to a highly trusted associate. It may also be significant that the Hebrew name Benjamin means son of the right hand. Benjamin recalled his earlier saying that he would give his people a name that never should be blotted out except it be through transgression. He pleaded with his people to remember to retain the name of Christ written always in your hearts. For how knoweth a man the master whom he has not served, and who is a stranger unto him, and is far from the thoughts and intents of his heart? In closing, he exhorted his people. Mosiah 5.15 Quote, Therefore, I would that ye should be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in good works, that Christ, the Lord God Omnipotent, may seal you his, that you may be brought into heaven, that ye may have everlasting salvation and eternal life, through the wisdom and power and justice and mercy of him who created all things, in heaven and in earth, who is God above all. Amen." Unquote. I think Benjamin's phrase that Christ, the Lord God Omnipotent, may seal you his is important. In an ancient context, to seal means to mark or imprint something in order to show ownership or authenticity. If we are steadfast and immovable, always abounding in good works, Christ will signify our covenant relationship with him by, metaphorically, placing his seal of ownership upon us. The Lord promised the people of Israel, I will walk among you and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. There is an alternative, one alternative, to being sealed by Christ. The prophet Amulek warned, If ye have procrastinated the day of your repentance, even until death, behold, ye have become subjected to the spirit of the devil, and he doth seal you his. Therefore the Spirit of the Lord hath withdrawn from you, and hath no place in you, and the devil hath all power over you, and this is the final state of the wicked. Conclusion Mosiah assumed his father's throne and established righteousness. Mosiah 6, verses 1 and 2, quote, King Benjamin thought it was expedient after having finished speaking to the people, that he should take the names of all those who had entered into a covenant with God to keep his commandments. And there was not one soul, except it were little children, but who had entered into the covenant and had taken upon them the name of Christ." Unquote. Benjamin consecrated Mosiah as the new king and appointed priests to teach the people, to stir them up in remembrance of the oath which they had made. According to the record, it had been 476 years since Lehi left Jerusalem. That would be about 127 BC by my calculation. Mosiah's reign, like his father's, was characterized by righteousness and Mosiah's support for his own material needs through his own labors. That concludes this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download these notes, this slideshow, and a handout for this lesson that outlines Benjamin's sermon. Next week, we're going to rewind the clock over three decades and read about what became of the Nephites who had returned to the land of Nephi in the days of Amalickiah and Mosiah I. The reading is Mosiah chapters 9 through 17. We'll cover Mosiah 7 and 8 as part of the lesson that follows the one next week. See you next time.